Hello, I'm Dr. Melvin Pride, and uh, Dr. Um, <laughs> Mark Myers is here with me also. Uh, three years ago, or maybe a little more than that, uh, I approached my department associate dean, which was Dr. Myers at that time, and asked him to consider having a series of conversations about race because of a sense of unrest in my spirit. We couldn't pick out exactly what was happening at that time, but we had a conversation. Dr. Myers saw my irritation and concern and are willingly agreed to have conversations. And we set about to come up with 10 questions that wanted, we wanted to ask of each other, but weren't uh, politically correct. We had established a relationship by this time, however, that could withstand honesty and authenticity. Since that time, we have made numerous presentations to faculty and at conferences using the basic con conversational approach to answering the questions while having these courageous conversations with each other. Dr. Um, so we have a little uh, kind of a, a request for you as the audience. Um, what you're about to witness is a grounded and tested relationship. Um, we are aware, though, that we do not have this relationship with you um, and that you are a guest into our friendship and into our conversation. Um, so you might witness growth. You might witness evidence of needed growth. Um, our, our presentation is not really about you know, who is right or wrong or who is woke and who is asleep. Um, it is an example of a discussion leaning on this relationship where two men from different contexts can meet and seek to listen and to seek to be understood. Um, so welcome and um, thank you for joining us. Um, part of the, the backdrop of this conversation is about relational cultural theory. When we uh, had this conversation first with faculty mm -hmm. and we were, which was kind of a stunning experience really. It yes, was, it was. <laughs> <laughs> we learned a lot from that and we were kind of surprised at some of the reactions. And, um, but uh, we, were, we were asking the question, what makes this work? Like why, why is it that, that Dr. Pride and I, Melvin and I can have this conversation um, and how is it that others could have this as well? Like what makes this work? And uh, we came across an article in um, Counseling and Supervision about um, relational cultural theory. And we started looking at the tenets of it. And, we were, and you know, it occurred to us, this is exactly how this can happen. This is why this is working. And so we have since you know, been kind of talking through and, and exploring this idea of how relational cultural theory and you know, basic tenets um, relates or empowers this conversation. So we obviously don't have time to discuss you know, the broad scope of this theory, but let me sort of highlight a few um, tenets of this theory. The people, people grow through relationship throughout the lifespan. So you know, one of the tenets is about um, that it's health and, and growth is not about being independent it's about growing, developing inside a relationship. Movement towards mutuality rather than separation characterizes mature functioning. Um, right, so moving together, like this is you know, part of the, what you would mention, like you, were, you reached out to me and you know, I, was, I, was, I, I was thinking in my mind, okay, so he, this is important to him, you know, he must be sensing something. And so being curious and, and <laughs> dangerous, um, I, I agreed. And even though some people are like, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Um, so we did it because I, I just believed, and obviously you did too, that the relationship was is with the context where this could actually happen. And that's certainly consistent with this, that mu movement toward mutuality rather than separation characterizes mature functioning. Um, the ability to participate in increasingly complex and diversified relational networks characterizes psychological growth, right? So connecting to others, relate, other relationships, other cultures. Um, mutual empathy, mutual empowerment um, are a core of, fo of gr growth fostering relationships. Mutual, mutual empowerment, mutual empathy, which you mentioned one point that um, like 
that you came, like I was your boss at the time, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, we were having this conversation and that it was, it was a, basically a release of power and a, and a, a you know, fostering mutual empathy. It was, yeah. Um, Good. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that struck me so much was, was that your, your empathy towards me, like you were even interested, right? So the black man, the older black man who has an incredible history um, of race, race relationships in, in his life, uh, is curious about my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, that was really stunning. And it, it kind of sticks out in this theory here. Um, so mutual empathy, mutual empowerment. Authenticity is necessary for real engagement and growth fostering relationships. Um, definitely. Also dangerous. Definitely. Yeah, dangerous, <laughs> but definitely the right way. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> when people contribute to, to the development and growth fostering relationships, they grow as a result of their participation in such relationships. Um, True. So the goal of, of development is the realization and increased relational competence over the lifespan. Um, so we, in, in joining this, um, this uh, conference section, you should have access Lord willing, if it all worked out well on um, VCA's end, that you should have access to uh, these, these slides that talk about these tenants and also have references to relational cultural theory. Um, anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, except that the, yes, I would, the, the theory itself sort of gives us a framework uh, if you apply it, does it work and how do you apply it? So our relationship had sort of built without knowing about the theory. And so right, yeah, we, we accidentally fell into uh, what the te theory was teaching us. Yeah. And so I think that that was a, a powerful uh, movement in our lives at that particular time to see that we could have this conversation without it being one in which we were both defensive or, yeah. or working against each other. And it allowed us to form even a deeper bond where we could go other places that we hadn't gone before. So yeah. it's a, a progressive growing type type of thing. And so yeah. we're still learning about each other in some time, some cases, and we're still bringing up questions because of the environment we're in now. Every day. <laughs> that we, have to, <laughs> we talk about, but yeah. openly and authentically. Uh, yeah. we've been, authenticity is huge in our relationship. So yeah, and, and we've been doing this for, I'm thinking five years. Yeah, at least maybe four. so. I know it was more yeah. than three. It was before Charlottesville. Yeah. Okay. Right, and yeah. it, was, it, was, it was before anything significant was, was happening in, yes. in the moment, in, you know, in the, in the news. Quite true, you know? quite true. Um, yeah. Which made me wonder, it's like, okay, so, you know, what's he seeing? What's he, yeah. you know? And I think at that time I was seeing and feeling something that I felt it, it wasn't right. And so yeah. uh, how do we now move out? And, and I don't know, I, I wish I could remember the exact circumstances yeah, that the too. first meeting Should that we had was, but yeah. I can see where we were, but I don't remember what was going on totally yeah. in the world at that particular time. Yeah. But yeah, good. Cool. Yeah. So in keeping with our, our you know, format from, yeah. from years ago, about questions, I have a question for you. Um, I, I grew up in poverty. I grew up in a single parent home. Um, government cheese, food stamps, they were all part of my life. Um, we, we lost our home when I was like 15, 16 years old, ended up in government housing, like not like formal government housing, but like subsidized section eight housing. Um, quit high school. Uh, I, you know, I ended up going to college through the military, through you know veterans benefits and the GI Bill, and um, ended up you know clawing my way through remedial classes at at community college. Um, so fast forward a bunch, you mm -hmm. know I have a PhD. I am you know I live in a nice neighborhood, very much like yours actually. Mm. <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, am I supposed to believe that I have what I have because I'm white? Is this the white privilege that we hear so much about? Like. I have this because I'm white. Wow. That's interesting. Um, even the first time that I heard your background, I know we didn't know our backgrounds. We didn't know each other's background. We didn't know where we came from or, or that much about us. And when you give your bio, I said, you know, probably stereotypically, 
someone would have picked that out for me as opposed to my right. bio, okay, and, and how I grew up. So I'll answer your question, by the way, about privilege, <laughs> but let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, my background, okay? I grew up in segregation. I grew up in Alabama, rural Alabama. So I went to schools where blacks and whites did not mingle together. It was colored in white, uh, signs for bathrooms, uh, water fountains, and all of that was colored in white. So I grew up during that era of a civil rights era, by the way. Uh, I went away to college, uh, which, uh, so this is about privilege. I went away to college, and at this um, HBCU, Historically Black College and University, I, I was able to get into that school, and at that time I had never ridden a bus, but, but my home was six hours away from Atlanta, Georgia, is where I was. And so trying to get back home, uh, Thanksgiving came, and so I had a week's break. I was excited. I was ready to go, you know, so I ran. I got to the bus station. I got my ticket, got first in line, standing up at the door, waiting on the driver to open the door so that I could get in, you know, and get my seat, and just excited about going home. Well, the driver came up to the door, and he looked at me, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I got my ticket. I'm going to get on the bus, you know, I'm ready to go home. He said, you don't do that at home, do you? It, it didn't register with me quite. It was just curiosity of why am I being treated this way? I forgot that I'm supposed to go to the back of the line because while I was standing there, a line of whites had formed behind me. And so he took all of their tickets. Then he took my ticket. And so when I got on the bus, that was privileged, by the way. But And so, <laughs> <laughs> but, right, so right. I got on the bus <laughs> later, all right? And I, on my way to my seat, I was wondering. I wasn't angry. I didn't get upset. Most of my friends got more upset than I did. My white friends got more upset right. than I did when I would tell them the story, but I didn't. But I had a sense of curiosity. Then? You had white friends then? Yeah, I had white friends then, okay. okay. But I didn't have a lot of white friends because yeah. I was in an HBCU and there was only several, two or three whites who were in the school, by the way. So anyway, but we were, we were friends, so we, we got along. We talked sometimes. But as I went back to my seat, I began to say, hmm, why am I being treated this way? I had grown up in segregation, so all I knew was segregation. I wasn't quite in the movement of civil rights at that time. Right. But this now began to awaken me. So not you just adapted to that. Yeah. It was not like apparent that no. what was going on. Exactly. It wasn't yeah. apparent. So I, I just got on. I sat back at the bus. I remember as I was going along, I began to think about, well, you know, um, looking back on my life later, I said, that incident was a incident that told me bridge building is an important concept that someday I would need to get involved in. How do you build bridges between yourself and the Caucasian or the white race? How do you, how do you build that type of relationship such that you can not feel like you, you don't belong or that you are an outsider coming in? Yeah. Well, I went on home, so from there, my life goes differently from there. But anyway, it, that was the awakening of, for me, and that was a time that I began to see how wrong it was to treat one individual a different way when there was no reason that that was to happen. But that was my experience at that particular time. Now, going back home, of course, uh, with my parents uh, and everything, there was... Um, you know, they couldn't vote at that particular time. Uh, they were, uh, we, the civil rights, the movement hadn't, hadn't taken place yet to, to get voting for them. Mm -hmm. So it meant that we were underprivileged, okay? Right. <laughs> we did not have the ability to do the things that, say, you could have done if you had been there. Right. Okay. And, that, and I've heard that story before, and every time you, you get to that part, <laughs> it still tweaks me. It still, it still bugs me. Yeah. I, you know, and and yet, it, it's hard. And I know that a lot of people struggle with this. And I'm still, you know, trying to get my mind around this part where, you know, that was a long time ago. Like, and and how does that affect today? Like, we are actually sitting in a fifty million dollar library um, that your wife ran, um, and uh, that it is. It seems to be very different today. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, you know, help, help me understand and help everyone, that, you know, understand is like, so it, it, when I look around today, it doesn't look like that bad. It doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to see this. Yeah. How, how is it different today? You know, is it really that different? Is it, you know, especially now when we talk about white privilege, mm -hmm. like it's different. You know, I think about, you know, how long, I don't know, I'm going to pose how long ago that was, but, <laughs> was but I'm thinking that would not happen today. Like, okay. you know, if you go to get on a bus right now, you're not going to get that scenario. Yeah. How is this different today? Well, it probably would happen earlier. It probably would happen at the ticket counter. That when I got ready to buy my ticket, if someone else and I kept stepped up together and they were white and I'm black and the cashier is, is white then that person will probably get their ticket first. Interesting. Okay. So you think all right. that? All right. Now, okay. that still happens, by the way. I didn't say it happens right. all the time, because that's putting a, a, a blanket, and I don't think you should put a blanket on all whites or all Caucasians. I really think if we're going to make it together, and if we're going to make a difference in this world, then we're going to need to be able to communicate. And if I alienate you, how can I communicate with right. you? Okay, so, so I, but privilege is, something to acknowledge. It exists. I mean, privilege is, um, I know that if I get stopped and you get stopped, the chances of something being different <laughs> for the two of us would be there. That would be not necessarily yeah. because they know me and not even that they know you, okay? But it's because of society has built this picture of black men, okay, black women as well, by the way. Right. But it is uh, people of color. So it has done that. And so, therefore, the person who doesn't have to think about that barrier, across that barrier, I've got to think about that barrier. I've got to think about it. I, can't, yeah. I have to teach my grandson, you know, how he should behave if he's pulled over for a traffic stop. I mean, you know, how he should... Uh, you know, you should do what the police say. All of us should. However, you should be able to ask a question. You know, <laughs> uh, otherwise you you um, you don't get a chance to uh, give your side or understand what is really happening to you. It's called, I think, it's called appreciating the person, the worth of a person, seeing them. They're not invisible. Um, right. uh, and many times, uh, as an African American male, I'm. I'm not seen, okay? And so that even happens now, that at different times I'm not seen. The other thing that talks about uh, privilege is that I don't know how many um, whites that go into a store and look around and see someone following them, okay? That happens, okay? Right. In, in society, that's what happens. It us. actually happened to me when I was a kid because I shoplifted. Right, well, you, and and you in, needed in to be In a small followed. town, <laughs> right. so they kind of knew. So. <laughs> but I didn't shoplift. But it's okay. a little, little different, I okay. guess, yeah. And let me say something, too, about my wife having been the dean. She was the first ma female and black dean of the Jared Falwell Library. She opened this library. In yeah. fact, she designed it for the most part. Um, she and I do not see that we get a pass because we had some success in life. We don't get a pass. We don't get to say, now that I've done this, I can drive down the street and I don't have to look around me. I don't have to worry about slurs or anything like that. The slurs still come. The things, the way that you're looked at, the way that you're treated when you're out. You can feel it sometimes. You have a sense of, of this is something's wrong here. It's microaggressions, by the way. It's, it's just, you, you can feel some of these things that are happening. And so it doesn't put us in a category apart from being black. We still have to do a, like a double consciousness. We're doing being black and also having the credentials that, that we have, okay, which doesn't put us in a cat different category. The problem that we have in, in uh, the United States, in the world, is that color becomes a defining type of uh, place to put you in. And, and that's, that's what we're dealing with now, which is why I believe we're having so many riots, so many uh, movements back against um, what's going on and, and giving more equity or equality, uh, fighting for it, uh, for African Americans. Um, now, that's what's happening. So I, I hope that answers you a little bit. So Yeah, I, I, it, well, it helps yeah. me I, yeah. with part of it. Like, yeah. there's another part of this, like, yeah. 
you know, I, I can, I see this, I recognize this. I, 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 I'm not blind to this. And, and certainly, you know, as your friend and as a, as hopefully a good human being, yeah. I want this to change. I want to be a part of this. Um, but it's hard to understand what this is and where my part is. Like, cause often when white privilege is mentioned, it's kind of like a finger pointed at me. Like I'm a white male, right? And, you know, I'm a white male, naturally born in the United States, uh, cisgendered, all that stuff. So I'm like the pinnacle of yeah. oppression, <laughs> right? So, yeah. um, so I, when, when the term is being thrown around, you know, white privilege, white privilege, I don't know what to do with it. Okay. Like, like, what does it mean to, like, what, what do you want me to do with the concept of white privilege? I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I okay. don't know. I can't change my race. Okay. I can't. You know, I, it, I don't, I don't want to believe that being white means that I'm racist. And so I'm some bad person. Mm. Um, I can, I see the part where, um, that the part where it affects you, like, like I could see being an outsider in a majority or a minority in a majority scenario. And, um, especially given, given so much history. But I, I, I guess I still struggle with what, what am I supposed to do with white privilege? I think that's, a, that's an excellent question or excellent thought to put out that more of us should have to discuss, not just you and I, and should discuss that. I think that sometimes, I don't speak for all black people, okay, by the way. Uh, however, I do think that my years and my wisdom uh, that God has granted me with tells me that in order to get along with a person or in order to make a change, then we've got to meet at a place where I don't antagonize you, okay? Now, white privilege to me means it's recognized it's there. I don't need to beat you up with white privilege, okay? But you do need to recognize that it exists, right. okay? And unfortunately, many do not recognize that it exists. It's a fighting word. Right. And sometimes the hammer is yeah. used as a hammer against you, okay? And I think that both are wrong. It's not a fighting word, but it is something that to acknowledge exists. And that way I become more visible, okay? I become seen more, okay? When I think about that and recognize that, you know, it's real, okay? It, it is real, okay? And in some situations it comes out. We see it a lot in the, obviously, in the news these days. So where a lot of that's coming out, okay, so. Yeah, and it's yeah. tough to watch. It's like yeah. no one's actually listening. Yeah, yeah, everybody's, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they get into their defensive postures and, and start yeah. shouting terms back at each other. Right, yeah. and it's distraction. It distracts us from the path that we should be on and able to make a change, a permanent change. One of the greatest things that I saw in the civil rights movement, I was a part of in the civil rights movement, and the greatest thing that I see today is a mixture of people, not just a diverse group of people yeah, who are pushing it for it. And it's the younger people who are pushing a lot for it. They are looking at it and they see the injustice. Uh, now, they've got some growth to do and they've got some realities to hit. There's gonna be some bumps in the road, yeah. but you and I can't change the whole world I can only change my circle. I can be active in my circle, yeah. I think. And so if God, if you're called to do something more, then you do something more. But, yeah. yeah. So, so. I think it's your that, question. Did that get to? <laughs> no, I think so. I, you know, okay. right. I still got to, you know, get my mind around it. But, and, okay. and, and to seek out, you know, ways to acknowledge it. Yeah. Without, obviously, like there, we talked about earlier at this quote about, um, being overly sensitive, like George Bush's quote about this um, soft bigotry of low expectations, right? So, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to know how to how to interact with this concept of you know privilege, mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean? You know, yeah. it's so it's hard to you know understand how do I approach this? How do I you know mm -hmm. relate to you mm -hmm. without being like demeaning or um, you know, like, or, you know, when, when we had first had this conversation, you had mentioned, we were talking about dangers and fears. And one of your concerns was that you didn't want to be pitied. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. through. 
and that I still have that, and I, yeah. I usually say that when we get together, is because yeah. when others are listening to me, I don't need sympathy. It, it just don't feel sorry for me. I, I, I think that I, I have uh, done well in managing uh, right. race relations and life. Uh, so sympathy is not there. Empathy says, walk in my shoes. What you and I try pretty hard to do, yeah. to walk in each other's shoes and see what that's like. That means then that we don't have to agree, but we can be civil with each other. And, and we try can to continue understand. To go, yeah, and try to understand, yeah. exactly. Open, open to understand. Yeah, because I know yeah. it changes me. Yeah, you know, it's okay. good. I, I like having these talks. Good, good, good. It changes me too, because I would never have known your background if we had yeah. not sat down to talk, we talked. We on a cert, we had a relationship on a surface level, but we didn't have the deeper relationship to understand some of the struggles that you also went through in your life. Okay, yeah. as we all did. Okay, all right. Um, what is your take on Black Lives Matter? <laughs> um, I, I'm confused. Okay, so and the media is, does this. You know, I have no problems. I mean, and I will stand here, I'll sit here with you and I'll say publicly on film, whatever, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I have no, you know, of course, of course they do. Mm -hmm. Good night, why are we even talking about this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's interesting to watch this play out and how it triggers people. It's like, wait, all lives matter. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, no, 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 listen, just listen, you know, Black Lives Matter. So I, the concept, the term, the, the cry, yeah. you know, the fist. Yeah. I get. I feel like I get that. I I I, I, under, I understand why that's happening. I think, mm -hmm. um, and and I hear it. But there's something going on here, like you know, under the surface, like you know, the whole Antifa thing, the whole you know, uh, you know the weird political, you know, extreme left wing stuff, and the writing and the stealing and burning of buildings and all this stuff, like, what in the world? Like, you know, if you, if you, it's, it's almost as if, like, a, a really good statement has been sort of overthrown or something or taken over mm -hmm. for this some other dark agenda. And so when I see all this stuff about, you know, Black Lives Matter and then, you know, groups of people saying, I'll never say that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, I, that's not, you know, you're not white supremacist. Why would you, why are you having issues here? There's somehow it gets entangled in this political thing. Yeah. And, um, and somehow, you know, it has this confusing, it's like, this is not simple. Like this is not clear socially. Mm -hmm. Um, so the organization seems a little creepy to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't really, I mean, would I wear a, a hat or a shirt, you know? Yeah. Under, oh, <laughs> over at certain places maybe. Um, but okay. so I'm confused. Like I don't. I feel like it's being taken advantage of. I feel like um, I, I can empathize with it, and I and I would, you mm -hmm. know, I would stand with you. Okay. But it's also something different. Yeah. You know? So. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned media and uh, reporting uh, of what you're seeing um, and calmness. Uh, <laughs> No fires, <laughs> no fighting. It doesn't seem to be newsworthy. <laughs> okay? You know, right. the right. camera goes to the person that set the fire, and it takes it off focus. And my sister-in-law has a saying, focus to finish. You know, so it's focus to finish. And hers is not related to Black Lives Matter necessarily, but is one that I'm adopting because I want to keep my eyes on the focus. The focus is equality. The focus is, is, is fair treatment. It's justice. Right. It's not uh, about burning buildings or looting or any of that. I think that there are some elements, because uh, people are people, but I think it's a minority that comes in and does things like that. And I don't think it's always, by the way, those people who are in the Black Lives Matter movement. By the way, I don't think so. I think that yeah, there's a I mixture. Think so too. It seems and like so, there are different groups going. Yeah, that's a mixture, and I, I can't put my finger on it and say yeah. exactly what it is. But my thought is, focus to finish. I want to keep my eyes on. I've lived long enough to see movements rise up, and move, movements movements peter out. Okay, they rise up when something is going on, and then they, they, they peter out. My focus to finish this time is saying, 
I might not see it, my children and grandchildren will, might see it, but to keep doing what I can while I'm here to, to stay on that track and it's about equality, it's about justice, it's about fair treatment. And by the way, black lives matter um, is, is important. Yes, all lives do matter. But if we don't focus on black lives, I mean, everybody benefits, by the way. So if black lives matter, your life definitely matters. I mean, you know, you can't want to get treated get treated any less uh, because you're not giving away. Right, anything. and I don't, I mean, when I hear yeah. it, I don't think, yeah. oh, that means white lives don't matter. Yeah, right. I, it's like, I don't hear that. You know? right. so. I know you don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, and which is, uh, but there's reasoning behind yeah. not to feel that way. By the way, if you ever get a chance to, and I don't think you have yet, uh, go to the um, uh, Smithsonian, uh, the no. African American Museum. Yeah, I'm looking and forward to that. I'm okay gone there and I was, even though I grew up during that era, I still see the preponderance of whites who were involved in the civil yeah. rights movement, okay? Uh, and now seeing this now, this diverse group of people now doing this, everyone will benefit. The, the, any minority will benefit, whites will benefit, right. because now you will have removed a separation from between us. Uh, if we focus to finish. Do you think uh, that's an accurate representation of that time? Of uh, the Smithsonian? Smithsonian? Yes, I do. I think yeah. it's uh, I, I think it's it's so educational. I learned a lot. Right. Uh, unfortunately, education around African Americans was not taught in schools when I came through school. And even now some of it is not completely true. But to get up there and to see the actual movement and what was happening during that period of time is a, an actual depiction and it also shows the number, as I said earlier, I was so shocked at the number of whites who were actively involved in the civil rights movement. It, it, was, it was powerful. Yeah. Um, and now, I don't know if they had conversations like we were having, okay, but I'd say this is another level that right. uh, I hope more and more people will get to yeah. talk like this. Yeah. So I was watching this video of, of Rush Limbaugh and Charlemagne the God. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, it's a, Charlemagne the God is a, is a very popular um, black radio personality. And they were, they were going to come together and have a conversation. And it went south. I mean, it just fell apart. And, you know, Rush Limbaugh evidently, you know, he just refused to acknowledge white privilege. And then Charlemagne got triggered and just blockaded. And he said... He made this statement, Charlemagne the God said, um, until, um, until the structure of white supremacy is dismantled, um, we're not going to get anywhere. I, this throws me, like, I don't understand this, you know, I, I, see, I see some things about, you know, that need to change, you know. Um, and I think some things are being overblown, like, you know, defund the police. I think that's overblown. Mm -hmm. That seems over the top to me. Um, uh, I mean, certainly change it, yes. But so I, this, this idea of dismantling mm -hmm. white supremacy in America, and, and until you do that, nothing is going to change. I don't know what to do with that. Like, like I look around in my life mm -hmm. and in this library, and I'm sitting with you, yeah. and I'm saying... Dismantle what? What you know? What is it? What is this you know systemic structured racism about? Like, can you respond to that? <laughs> I don't think we have enough time on this. <laughs> 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 right. However, uh, uh, yeah, let me let me speak to that because both of those uh, those um, personalities build and thrive on emotion um, right. rather than reality. Okay. My experience with white privilege was that when my parents were unable to vote growing up before they had the right to vote, um, I remember they would always get a newspaper every, every week. I grew up with my mother and my father, by the way, no, no food stamps, okay? okay. But, <laughs> but we, didn't, we, were, we were poor, Privilege. but we didn't know we were poor. We, went out and we had fields, so we went out and worked right. in the fields and we, we brought in our own, own crops, okay? Uh, but I was looking at it, that newspaper, and I still, as a kid, I remember looking at that paper, and it had a voting ballot on the newspaper, and on, on that written on that ballot was white supremacy. I never knew quite 
what that meant, but it was strange to me. But then my mother said that they couldn't vote, and so it, it meant that only whites voted. And I went, white supremacy, and so I, 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 you know, I really, really stick, stuck with me, even today, I think about that. And it's, a, it's an ideal or a, a method in which many of these systems were formed and everyone had to conform to what is the white way of doing it. And so white supremacy was king, meaning that whatever, like me in the bus, I, I had to move, okay? <laughs> and it wasn't, and it's because of all of these institutions that are put together. You know, I, I couldn't go to a, uh, my school, I couldn't go to a white school, I had to go to, uh, uh, I mean, people in the North could, but where I was, I, I couldn't right. do that in the South. Um, so, and it said that the white person is king, which complete, continuously to put the black person as less than, okay? And so, Dismantling white supremacy was placed into the institutions like of school, of education, of, of, of medicine, of medical facilities. You know, where is close to the, these people were redlined into, the black people were redlined into places that they could live. And so they couldn't accumulate wealth because of the system, okay? They couldn't look at homes in this particular neighborhood. And so, and so, so you're, yeah. you're, are you saying that, that the structure itself yes. Yes. is is sort of you know built off a certain perspective yeah. and and sometimes a racist perspective and that that structure still exists yes and it, yeah. and it is affecting you yeah it affects it's going to affect my children it's going to affect my grandchildren it's going I'm looking now past me we learned to just forge ahead as I was growing up we 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 didn't let obstacles stop us in my right. family. We, we try to find a way around, a way to manage it. It didn't fix it, it managed it. Right. And it shouldn't be managing these things. It should become more and more open. And right. so, yeah. So Which I guess <laughs> is why, um, you know, part of this, you know, anti-racism yeah. work. Yeah. And, and why, you know, it might be important to actually, instead of just, you know, talking about it or, to actually making efforts to move towards it, you know, to, to, to you know, deconstruct it. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. that's uh, something that I guess each of us, black and white, need to be looking at um, not turning our eyes away from something that's an injustice. Right. But if we see an injustice, then we need to, to, to take some action if we can. Yeah. And not everyone, by the way, I think it's called to, to do everything, but the part that I can do, I need to be conscious enough and to see it when it happens. Yeah. And I think, and, and, and step up to it uh, if I'm in a position that I can do so. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I'm really thinking that if we are gonna make a change, there's gotta be commitment to that. We gotta commit to it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So we're running low on time. Low on time? Are we at the end? <laughs> we're at, we're at, we're in, it looks like we're really close to the end. Okay. And All I right. think, I guess, you know, bef before you close, I, I would just want to kind of highlight, you know, if you were to go back and look at the slides about r relational, you know, cultural theory, um, that, lean, that leaning on relationship, one of the things that you said months ago that really struck me is that you, you and I'm going to botch this, but... You said, I believe that um, if anything's going to change, if we're going to address this, it needs to be done together. Yeah. Um, that, you know, it's even, even you had noted, like even at, throughout history, you realized it was yeah. only when people came together that stuff really actually changed. Exactly. Um, right. And I think that's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. this, like this relational cultural theory is it's like kind of just, you know, I guess clarifies or maybe maybe even proposes a model yeah. for working that out. I think it's the closest thing I've seen. We both, you looked at it, you found it, and then uh, we began to look at it. I think it's the closest model from a counselor perspective right. uh, that, that gets us there. And it's a way of, way of approaching life. Um, it's a way of approaching relationships with, with others. Uh, you talked about the two 
uh, Rush Limbaugh and uh, Charlemagne coming together, and because they use more emotion than fact, because uh, that's news, okay? But then, and so there had to be an argument. There was going to be a disagreement. There was not going to be a let's have a, a genuine conversation. Okay, right. it, it couldn't happen with them. Um, however, I I I, um, I think that both sides, black, white, minority, majority, really have to come together. If it's going to be a change, there has to be more. I don't think it's utopia where everybody's going to do it. But, the, but those that, that can should do it. And if they do it, then they will make the change that, that we're looking for. Um, and I think that as society goes on and these young, uh, younger people now that have, are coming along and, and, and taking some steps, I think that that's where it's going to really make some progress, okay? Yeah. Much more progress than now. I don't think this time and period we live in right now is a flash in the pan. I think that this is something that can be pr pr uh, promoted forward. I hope it you know, matures. Like, yeah, me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> the whole reactive shame, judgment <laughs> yeah, okay. stuff, I hope that okay. goes away so people right. can actually feel safe to have a conversation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, well, when we decided to present at VCA, <laughs> we had no clue about how the 20, how 2020 would look at this particular time. We didn't know that this was going to occur. We didn't know that the pandemic was going to occur. We didn't know that George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Jacob Blake, Jonathan Price. Uh, we didn't know those names. They were names we didn't know. And so, and COVID-19 uh, was unheard of, and economic instability was unheard of because we were coasting along kind of nicely, uh, I think, here in, in, in the country, from that pers perspective anyway. Uh, in his new album, uh, John Bon Jovi had uh, two new songs that address these times, I believe, and they are America Reckoning and America's On Fire. In his words, when he was singing the other day on TV, it, it speaks to racial injustice, gun violence, and COVID. He said, do what you can, and in the spirit of John Lewis, we may make good trouble with our conversation and observations. Good trouble. And so, not selling the album, just saying that the song. <laughs> I, the song. I didn't see you for a Bon Jovi fan. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you don't know, right? <laughs> okay. But it was, it was powerful, powerful songs to listen to. And so, and I think that with that, that closes out our time yeah. together today. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thank you for being with us.